That Great Business Show, Ireland's Best Business Podcast. Welcome to episode 128 of That Great Business Show, posting on the 24th of February, 2023. I am Conal O'Moran. We bring you 45 minutes of business tips, insights and opportunities, thanks to Dundeal.ie. Coming up is your town fit for business, and I'll be asking about public space theft. We have an award-winning Cork company that's creating free gas for cooking. And in another in our mini-series about creating value in your business, we explain the importance of a brand, no matter how small your business is. And do, do, do head to our updated website, that is thatgreatbusinessshow.com, and sign up for our sneak peeks and other benefits to be announced. And all our business tips and insights are brought to you thanks to our sponsor, Dundeal Motors, the only place to go for your new or second-hand motor, all from the convenience of your couch. Dundeal Motors is home to Ireland's largest range of new and premium used cars. That's why you'll find cars from Audi and BMW dealerships on Dundeal. Are you looking for a seven-seater to accommodate your growing family? Maybe you're after a luxury saloon to make a statement. We have the car for you. You'll also find Ireland's largest range of electric cars to help you make the switch. Visit dundeal.ie today to start the search for your next car. Viscosity. When you shave, you want the highest viscosity because it helps the blade run smoother. De facto, the world's best shaving oil has incredible viscosity. That's why De facto leaves your face, underarms or legs nick-free. Higher viscosity makes blades last longer. De facto is the best for your skin and your pocket. DeFactoShave.com All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. Now, our first guest on this episode, 128, is a man whose contrarian views on the economy and wider issues can be read each week in the Sunday Independent. He gets right royally savaged on social media for those views, views I mostly agree with, which is one of the reasons I admire him. He challenges the orthodoxy and asks the hard questions that others don't. And he keeps going and going, speaking truth to ideologues. One time head of TUD's Department of Environment and Planning, Connor Skeen is now an entrepreneur in his own right, so he knows about business. And today he's here to talk about whether there's any future for businesses in Irish Towns. Conor Skian, welcome to That Great Business Show. Good morning, Margaret, and uh, thank you for having me. Oh, fight to rot. Future of towns and businesses in towns. I know that um, Bobby Bobby um, Kerr is a, a big fan of talking about the high street. You're going to talk about the high street and whether it's fit for business or fit for purpose. That's right. Well, I... Uh, as they say, how do you follow an introduction like the one you just gave me, except by being exactly what you predicted, namely a contrarian. And, and uh, a I'm going to begin, and a curmudgeon. And uh, I'm going to begin by uh, talking about uh, one of the things that's dearest to my heart, but not always in a good way, which is SMEs in Ireland, uh, because they are on the one hand the backbone of the Irish economy, and yet on the other hand they're extraordinarily unproductive, unprofitable, and uh, sorely in need of a kick in the pants. Uh, one of the reasons I want that I'm so interested in them um, is because even though uh, they take, they've about 1.1 million people employed in them and they, they have about 75% of the workforce, they only add 35% to the GVA. Not very good. Uh, so, Well, to we, be fair now, hang on, like, you cannot compete and like for like with the Googles and the Pfizers of the world who ship supposedly high value items out of here and make it look like others are less productive. Well, now, if your listeners could see me, I'd be in my pantomime mode going, oh, yes, you can. Uh, absolutely you can, because all of the people in all of those uh, other F, uh, F the 
foreign direct investment companies, they're all Irish people. They're run by, occupied by and uh, expanded by Irish people. The reason those people come to Ireland uh, is always mistakenly uh, assumed to be the tax regime here. They may come here the first time, but the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth and the tenth expansion they put in is because of the levels of productivity they get. So the Irish people who run those things are world class people working for world class companies, producing world class levels of productivity. And I know because my other business, as you were called, is I'm the consultant who gets in their panic missions and their environmental licenses. And I've been doing that for 35 years for all the biggest of them. And they're off the scale. I don't think I've, I could count in one hand the number of times in that time I've been answerable to clients who are anything other than Irish people. So let's kill that lie before we begin. So the challenge is there that the Irish SME sector are the brothers and sisters and wives and husbands of all those other people. If they can do it, why can't we? Now, get to the heart of what you wanted to talk about, which is the Irish economy. A question you seldom hear asked is where is the Irish economy? Ka Wilshe. And the answer is that it actually has quite readily definable places where it happens. It has three main places. And if you stop and your listeners stop to think about it, they're actually quite easily recognised. So most of the people who produce most of the taxes and most of the value addition for Ireland, those so-called FDIs, they're all actually out at the edge of the city or in the countryside. A staggering number of the most profitable ones, which are in the pharma sector, are out in the countryside, in the deep countryside. The second group of people are the SMEs. The SMEs are mostly in and around settlements, main settlements, not so many in the country. And the third group of people who are economically active in Ireland are people who are involved in provision of public services, who are a gigantic number of people, and they're kind of evenly split, urban and rural. So it's very important to try and get your head around the fact that there is actually a map of where Ireland is in terms of its economic activities. So returning to the people that I'm most interested in, and I think you are too, which is the SMEs, Our towns, our settlements and our cities of all sizes are where the action happens. And if we care about the future of our SMEs and we care about the future for Ireland being able to grow and maybe be less dependent on FDIs, we've got to desperately care about those towns and make sure that they have a future. I believe currently they don't. And I think most of the reasons are that we get in our own way and uh, we are self-harming in them. So that's my laying out my controversial card for you. Thank you. I love it. But explain more about how we get in our own way and who gets in the way and why do they get in the way and, and, and. Um, we, are, we get in our own way uh, in, t- in two sets of ways. The first is that we plan Ireland very badly. Now, I gave up 20 years of my life to be the head of the Department of, of Planning because I thought planning was so bad and rather than give out about it, I went in and did something about it. You didn't do a very good job teaching it, 20, you? Exactly. <laughs> put 20 years into it and it was the biggest school of planning in Ireland and planning, planners and planning are part of a system so I can't say I didn't try to do something about it uh, but we'll come back to another day why, why it didn't work. So that system of dealing with, because planning is about managing change. That's the only job planners have is to manage change. A lot of people <laughs> when, I, when my daughter... Uh, so it was little. We, she came out one day with me and I was doing work in Navan up in County Meath and I had a big piece of paper with me and she knew roughly that uh, I had something to do with making plans and here I was with a big piece of paper and we were standing on the outskirts of the town and I was consulting a map and we happened to be beside a place where there's a lot of roadworks and she looked at the drawing and she looked at the roadworks and she looked at me and said, Dad, when's Navan going to be finished? <laughs> and it gave me a moment of clarity because I suddenly realised a lot of people overlook that we use the same word plan for a building, house, and we do for a town. And the objective of the builder and the architect is to finish the house satisfactorily so that it ends up looking just like the drawing. Planning is never finished. Navin will never be finished. In fact, if it did, we'd be failed. And it's a totally different process. So I used to try and teach my students that planning uh, is managing change. And the first slide I would show them was a dance. Uh, lots of people at an opera, so it's or at a, at an event, a ball, and so planning is is a dynamic thing that's happening all the time, and we are obsessed with a planning system that's about trying to paint and colour in pictures, and not enough about managing change. So to, to get to the heart of your your question, there's a huge amount of change happening all over Ireland, indeed all over the world at the moment, and there's a series of forces that are at work. There's demographic forces, there's young people, there's new people, there's people with different expectations and different backgrounds, needing and wanting to live in different places. Which is the world always and forever. Yes. But so there's nothing new there. The forces that are driving it are different. So I did a lot of work at one stage in my life for the United Nations and I would find myself in incredibly out of the way sort of places. Unfortunately, my work was usually 
just coming in after a war or after a disaster. So you weren't always meeting people at their best. But when you stripped away all the awful stuff, people all over the world are the same. And I'd find myself in a very remote village in Nepal or Afghanistan or Sri Lanka or somewhere like that. And you'd be talking to the people in the village and they, if you, if you changed accents and clothes, they were all saying the same thing, which was something along the following line. Ah, you should have been here 20 years ago. Ah, all the young people have left. Ah, it's only any good at times of festivals now. Ah, it's only any good when the bus comes in at the weekend. So okay. same the world over. And that is because agricultural societies are changing. Ireland is changing. We still have a picture of ourselves as being an Irish uh, uh, agricultural economy. It's a rapidly urbanising economy. But we're still trying to build settlements as if we were a rural people where the town was the problem or the enemy. And if you ended up living in town, you were a failure. So the point of what you're trying to tell me is that we've got in our own way of building towns or settlements that aren't fit for purpose and are in the way of business? Well, in the way of a whole lot of things. So when I first came back to live in Ireland, uh, the very first conference I was asked to speak at was the National Housing Conference. And uh, I was given a topic and the topic was the village as an alternative to urban sprawl. And all these high-minded architects and planners thought this was a good thing and I was supposed to know what I was talking about, so I'd give them the talk. So like an idiot, I went off and researched the topic, going back to your introduction, because one of the the things that I do is I try to make sure that whatever views I espouse are driven by facts and data. That and always helps, but it's not a, a usual thing. No, and the problem is throughout the debates we used to have in our house throughout COVID when we were all locked together, the young people of the house, uh, we used to tell people that there were four courses to each meal. There was the start or the main course, the dessert and the argument. And the young people would always leave the table going up the stairs, roaring back down, you and your... Facts. <laughs> so <laughs> facts are not friendly things for people's opinions. But coming back to our villages and towns, the, the talk I gave uh, when I did the research showed that the village was a very poor substitute for urban sprawl and that ordinary Irish people were making very uh, economically and socially sensible decisions by doing horror of horrors their own house out in the country because they were getting much bigger standards, much better space, much higher levels of construction. When they came to the village, they were penalised. They had problems with parking, problems with access, problems with space, problems with dirt, problems with noise, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they were actually making very intelligent choices. So I have basically spent my whole life trying to understand what, how does that happen? How do we get in our own way? And in villages and towns up to quite a big size, and I'll begin the, the villages and towns because I think if you can solve for the small, the big kind of solves itself. Um, one of the things that most villages and towns are destroyed by <clears throat> is the main businesses in the town. Meaning? Meaningful silence. Um, so, for instance, uh, I will typically, I have a company that just does nothing else except give services to local authorities trying to plan towns and villages. That's all it does. And um, I go to a town typically. One of the first things I'm to told when I meet the, uh, the businesses is that, oh, the place is wrecked. There's no parking. And they say two things to me. They say the council are trying to get rid of all the parking because they're trying to have these pedestrianisation schemes and they're trying to give all the space that's left over to the hotels, the pubs and the cafes public space theft, to which we'll return another time. Uh, and they say there's nowhere for people to shop uh, or to park, so they're not coming in to shop and I'm going out of business. We then go and do bad things, which consist of surveys. And we actually go out first thing in the morning, look at the cars as they arrive in and ask everybody, where are you from? And what we find is that the parking is all taken up by the employees of the shops who are complaining about there being no parking. That's easy to fix. You would think. I was going to say, it's not that easy to fix if they're coming from hither and thither. No, no, no. They're going to come in cars. They're not coming in donkeys. Yeah. Uh, they're going to come, but they have to have somewhere to park. Yeah. So the next thing we do, and I, I have been at this game long enough that I always make the next suggestion is if I'm doing it for the first time each time, which is say, why don't we park the cars around the backs of the businesses? All mm -hmm. oh, the spaces are too skinny. It's hard to get in, da, 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 da. And I go around and look at the backs and all the backs of all those towns all look the same. There are all these dilapidated stone walls and stinky sheds that used to have something in them that aren't used anymore. So look, point a bunch, you get together, knock your places together and you can all get a bit of parking out of that. No, no, I won't do that. that, that I would compromise the development value of my land. I would. Okay. So, so inevitably, yeah. it is the landowners having unrealistic exam ideas about the ultimate value of their land. So often, usually in fact, it is the hope value of the main businesses who own most of the main street that are killing those main streets. You think, oh, well, that's happening in Ballygo backwards. That wouldn't be happening here, right? We're having this conversation in South County Dublin at the moment. I've gone and looked, looked at places like Dunleary's Main Street. Exactly the same factors are happening there. They have all the population you could wish for. They've all the, the communication. They've all the transport. They've all the wealth. They've all the opportunities. And yet 
dying on its feet for exactly the same reasons. So that's the one side of it. So the SMEs themselves are killing their main streets. The local authority is full of hardworking planners, many of whom I have trained. And the planners are arriving thinking that they're going to save it. There's a phenomena in my business and it's called being loved to death. Well-intentioned people causing unintended consequences due to well-intentioned actions are a very common problem all over the world. Every village in Ireland and town is probably dated to about a period between about 1840 and 1890, roughly, right? Old, but you know what? In the bigger scheme of things, not very old at all. But they're all declared to be architectural heritage areas and conservation areas and anything else with a label you could stick on it. So when you go in, uh, going back to the original paper I wrote and say you did have a building in one of those places that you had a business in, you might as well be trying to climb Mount Everest in your underpants as to allow that thing to be developed, to be modernised, to have the backs knocked in. You're fighting the planners, you're fighting the traffic engineers, you're fighting the insurance companies and you're fighting a whole range of people. When I set up recently, I got married recently to, to my wonderful Nicola Byrne, we decided to, as you said, be contrarians like live healthy fish. We swam against the flow, got an old house uh, that was a shop in the middle of Malahide village and I uh, converted to a house. The obstacles that are put in your way of trying to take an old building, it's the oldest building in Malahide, and convert it back are unbelievable. And only that I'm in the business, as the man said, and that Nicola is a very tenacious woman, uh, we would have abandoned it. So uh, the things that we were encountering were the well-intentioned actions by hard-working, hard-pressed, well-educated officials, but they're singing from the wrong script. Fix it, please. Uh, the the fixing would be in most of those towns and villages to begin by the identification of the problem, to do what you introduced me as doing in the beginning, to tell people a bunch of things they need to hear that they don't want to hear first. Secondly, lead uh, from the back. Get those people to make it be their own plan. Point out the problem. Invite them to come to you with solutions. The third thing to do is to change the categorization of a number of standards we have. And they're everything from building regulations and fire regulations about what you can or can't do in a building and understand that these are special types of buildings, different rules apply, all the way through to how much of the building you can knock down or keep. Right. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to keep the flame alive of the place and a flame is always changing and always moving. And what you're trying to do is hold on to what my late wonderful friend Neil McCulley used to call the palimpsest. So you can still read the plan of let's pretend it's Westport, but the buildings of Westport might be gone. All the cells in my body and your body, they're different cells every year. Why can't our towns and villages be the same? An amazing place that's vibrant and alive, but always changing and always developing. And what you're trying to do is to hold on to that pattern of continuity of identity and activity. The activity is more important than the building. And if you lose the activity, all you have are skeletons. We don't want skeletons. I could talk to you probably for the next couple of days about this, but we will be constrained on time. But I do want to ask, because you mentioned it there, about public space theft, mm. because I think this is really interesting. Yeah. Discuss, please. Public space theft uh, refers to the fact that anything economic has to do with the extent and availability of a resource, and that could be land for building on, it could be metals for making stuff out of. Public space is an incredibly rare thing. It's where the buildings aren't. So cities are accumulations of very valuable land and the most valuable land is the place where the buildings aren't. Right? And we have to have it, we have to be able to get through, we have to be able to get access to the places. So it's a very valuable resource and the closer you get to the centre of a settlement, the more value it is. And that produces all kinds of things like why buildings get high and why nobody owns houses or, you know, as you get closer to the town. There's very different dynamics. But the main thing to focus upon is its scarcity. And the things about streets is that streets are not just scarce, but they're incredibly special. So any particular street does 10 different jobs in the course of a day. So it is carrying all kinds of buried services underneath it. It is conveying people to the bus and the train. It's allowing the kids to get to and from school. It's allowing uh, shop owners to have frontage. It's allowing people to get their post delivered. It's allowing the bus to pass through. So it's running lots and lots of services, which is great, good, complex, always difficult to manage. Uh, problems begin when people do two things. When they start to erode it, so uh, we're well used uh, in planning to understand the, the building line, that if you build your building out in front of the building line, you're stealing public state space and you get massacred for it. And you used to go to uh, you know countries like England, which have much older surviving buildings, and you see those buildings from Elizabethan times, the way they step in over the street, they're basically trying to steal a bit of extra space They go up. Happens the world over, happens in Japan as well. It's exactly the same thing. So we know how precious that street space is. Currently, particularly particularly post-COVID, we're living in a world where people who are in public office and the people that 
supposedly are the elected representatives, are delighting in giving away that public space to make themselves popular with publicans, cafe owners and hoteliers. I so agree with you. I don't get it. And what's more is, once they take occupation of that, that's it, it's gone. They'll keep that. Exactly. Once I saw it happening, um, I began to, to, little alarm bells went off my head because at one stage of my life, I used to spend a lot of time in Brussels and uh, you go out into the small streets. I love the cafes and all the bars, but you see the jealousy with which they push out those glass screens at the start of every day and the little roofs over them. The important thing in Brussels is you are in so much trouble with the police if you don't push them back on the hour every day. They have had the rules because they've had 800 years of practice. You get that, it's like an all black uh, jersey. You get a loan of the jersey for the match, you have to give it back. You get a loan of the street for the day, you have to give it back. In Ireland, we're waltzing into it. Daydreamers, like sleepwalkers, giving away this land. And the publicans, uh, the publicans are the worst, closely followed by hoteliers and cafe people who are saying we've a right to make a living. Absolutely, you do have a right. Good luck to you. But you know what? You make a living in a managed society where you allocate resources for the common Good. All over Ireland, there are community groups who are fighting against this. We're currently having a new sale of alcohol bill go through the Oireachtas, uh, which is riding roughshod over that. It's changing the ability to object in the district court. The planning system is colluding with it by endless adjustments to the planning legislation to allow people to serve food and drink and uh, takeaways in the outdoors. It's an extraordinary thing that's happening, and it's happening on our watch. Connor, you have got to come back. I could, as I say, talk to you all day about this. There is one final question that we ask our guests. Who would Connor Skeen hire in a heartbeat? I already have. I married her, Nicola. Ah. <laughs> now, do explain this. Nicola, I know really well. Nicola is, is a she's serial an entrepreneur. Well. Yeah. yeah, And she started 11890 and Cloud90 and a whole bunch of things. And she's currently uh, running a new company now called Risk Guide that, uh, my, that provides a uh, care for you, social media online. So it, it, it guards your reputation with an insurance product. Amazing thing. Will you come back to us, Conor Skeen? In a heartbeat. Great. Thank you. Conor Skeen, thank you for joining us on That Great Business Show. Dundeal Motors is home to Ireland's largest range of new and premium used cars. That's why you'll find cars from Audi and BMW dealerships on Dundeal. Are you looking for a seven-seater to accommodate your growing family? Maybe you're after a luxury saloon to make a statement. We have the car for you. You'll also find Ireland's largest range of electric cars to help you make the switch. Visit dundeal.ie today to start the search for your next car. Want to increase sales, reduce overheads and provide customers with a better service? Then use Big Red Web, the easiest way to develop and maintain your website. It gives you powerful business reporting, digital marketing and automatically integrates with the award-winning Big Red Cloud Accounting software. It's a game changer for SME businesses. It's so good, the government gives you a €2,500 grant towards it. Big Red Web, e-commerce made simple. BigRedCloud.com forward slash web. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. I think Clonakilty in West Cork is probably Ireland's most entrepreneurial town, whatever it is they have in the water there. Taking just two well-known businesses, they have the well-known Clonakilty Distillery and, of course, Clonakilty Sausages, headed by Clet Toomey. She joined us back on episode 87 of that great business show and her story of graft is well worth a listen. Today, we bring you a micro business from Clonakilty. It's the award winning My Gug, M Y G U G, that turns your ordinary food waste into cooking gas. The company was recently named the AIB and Yield Lab AgTech Startup 2023 at the AgTech UCD Accelerator Program. Fiona Kelleher, founder of My Gug, welcome to that great business show. Thank you so much, Connell. Delighted to be here. What a lovely voice, what a lovely accent, because that's a lovely part of the world down there, isn't it? Yes, I completely agree. A great part of the world. What is it in the water that makes people like you so entrepreneurial? I don't know. I think we're inspired by being in Clannacilty by the entrepreneurship around us, that's for sure. And there's a great ecosystem of innovation and creativity in Clannacilty. So it's the ideal spot. Yeah, which is, that's kind of nice background, but is there somebody down there pushing you, prodding you, making you? What is it? I mean, I am absolutely serious. There are two brilliant places. Carlo's curious for the amount of entrepreneurship, but Clannacilty, I think, beats all other 
similar sized t- towns. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting because I suppose for us, um, one of the great things about uh, being in Cork Northwest is the Leo program that's there. And they're very proactive in that part of the country and we've had amazing support for them. So that's one thing that's really, really key, I think, for startup businesses in that area. And we're part of a good community of business and we all get to know each other through that program as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's that. And then also, I suppose in a small town like that, everybody knows everybody and everybody's really willing and open to help. It's an amazing place to feel like you're part of something that's really thriving and everybody's supportive of everybody else's progress. So that's another, it's like a community spirit that you won't find in lots of places, but in Clonakilty, it's there in spades. I hate telling people about Clonakilty <laughs> because they might just go and, uh, you know, book out the place and destroy the place because it is so lovely. Anyway, let us get to your business because you make anaerobic digesters and you're not an engineer. You're not no. a designer. You're not, you're a musician. That's right. Discuss, explain. Discuss and explain. Well, indeed, I am a musician. And in COVID times, when things all went a little bit quiet for us, I decided to pivot on the basis of uh, looking at a business. It was like an opportunity, really, to take a a dive into something different. And my husband and business partner, Kieran Coffey, is a design engineer and mechanical engineer. And he had created a product a good few years ago, a prototype that he was working on. And uh, we decided to give it a go and see what the world would think of his invention. And so far, so good. But you say we decided to give it a go, but it had to be you to promote it. I mean, you are the promoter behind this. Yeah, I'm the promoter. I suppose what I decided was I would take those kinds of creative skills that I had working in the creative world and see if they made any sense in the business world. And you told me that they do. They absolutely do. Actually, with the kind of supports that are available in the business world in Ireland and the startup world, it's amazing really how creativity is valued. And we found that we got great support in terms of the idea. We were able to shape it in a particular way. We learned a huge amount on various programs and with mentoring and support. And we managed to shape it into something that was digestible to an audience. (laughs) So, yeah, it's gone very, very well. And, well, besides winning awards, you've also won 10,000 quid, which is, I'm sure, dead handy. Oh, yeah. But you're beyond that because you are exporting. Now, we'll get back to exporting in a second because I want you to describe it to people. If they go onto the website, they will see what looks just like an egg. It is a very nicely designed product, which is to my, in my view, unusual sometimes, but it's a gorgeous looking product. Thank you. Um, Designed by my husband, Kieran Coffey, Um, it's an egg, it's inspired by nature and we're celebrating nature with this product. We're elevating the status of food waste with this product and turning it into something that's a resource. So we're saying to people, don't look at your food waste as a problem, look at it as a solution. And in order to do that, you want to create something to put your food waste in that glorifies it, that elevates it to the status of an energy creator, which of course it is. So with MyGog, you can take your food waste, put it into it, it will digest the food waste and turn it into an energy for cooking and an energy for growing. And it allows food business to create a circular economy in their business on site, getting rid of their food waste bill and creating free energy. And you have de-emphasised <laughs> the, um, the domestic market Mm. because you feel that the real action is in where food amounts are large. Where food amounts are large and where they're significantly burdensome for business and also where energy prices, energy shocks, lack of predictability in the market in terms of energy is a problem and a concern and also where sustainability matters more and more. So we tick all of those boxes for businesses and we're hoping to encourage businesses to take on the sustainability role in a way that makes sense for them. And we think that this is the solution for them. So you are looking for restaurants, I presume, and uh, I won't say anything about the food and restaurants, but a high, a high amount of waste is good. That means more gas, does it? More gas, but I suppose what you'd say is really, and I think this is really important, in the first instance, you want to reduce your food waste. In the second instance, you want to reuse and even when you do that, you are going to have plenty of food waste that is not usable in a restaurant that can go into your digester. How quickly do you manufacture ga- gas out of this stuff? Once you start feeding the egg, the MyGog system, you'll get gas and fertiliser from it at the same time about three days later. Well, and from then, you just keep feeding it. It's about like any of us. You keep feeding and we keep going. That's and it. how much gas? So for the biggest model, which takes 18 kilograms of waste per day, that's the maxi model, you'll get about six hours of biogas a day. So on two rings, that means three hours of biogas a day. So you can feed it everything. You can put in your cakes, 
your cereals, your greases, fats. You can put in chicken carcasses. You put in all your green. So everything can go into it cooked and raw. And from that, you get a lovely gas and a nice rich biofertilizer for growing. And the growing is important, Connell, because in a circular economy in any business, you want to be growing food. And we would love to encourage more businesses to grow food if they can. I saw that on your website is mm. that uh, lovely red tomato sitting there. Yeah. If you were, if you had your tomatoes now, I've just been down in Tesco, there's not a tomato to be had. Isn't it amazing? It, it is amazing. Yeah. So, and we have the power here in Ireland is the best place, the best country in the world to be growing food. So, you know, we need to pivot into that. We need to look at that. Every restaurant owner listening will be asking, yeah, but that's fine. How much? How much does it cost? And how quickly can you manufacture it? And where does it come from? And, then and, and. Yeah. So we have three models available for the commercial market. And the first is the Mini. That's the smallest one. And that is €8,900. And for that, that includes installation and delivery. And you get a biogas cooker with that as well. And that's important because the biogas is not the same as your we call it town yes, gas. it's not the same. So you, never the twain shall meet. You have to have a separate biogas cooker. So in commercial kitchens, you would have your biogas cooker on one side and then your other gas on the other, your LPG or propane or butane or whatever it is. But that other one, the one that you are feeding, can b- bubble away for the it soups or whatever. Bubble away yeah. for the soups, the poached eggs in the morning for the breakfast service, whatever you want. Yeah. So that's 8,900 and that's then the when you get into one. the larger operations. The larger ones, then there's a MIDI and that is 16,500 and that will take 11 kilograms of food waste per day. Is the, that a lot? I do not know what 11 kilograms well, is relative is, yeah, to a restaurant. I suppose, you know, we're talking to a lot of restaurants who would say, look, we might be producing up to 200 kilograms of food waste per week. A you week? Know. So I that's, gonna, I thought yeah, you were say a day. Which seems a lot, you know, to us. But big hotels will do that kind of of food waste. Now, I suppose what we're trying to do with our product is encourage, first of all, reuse, you know, and reduce your waste and then use this product. So do two things at the once. Try and bring down the waste that you have to a level where you can use this product effectively. And at the moment, we have three models. The biggest model is the Maxi, which will take the 18 kilograms of food waste per day and produce up to six hours gas per day. But that one will take up to, so you're talking about maybe 126 kilograms of food waste per week. And a lot of businesses might be above that, but we're saying reduce reuse and then channel it into a digester. Or get a second one of your digesters. Get another one if you need. And how much is the large one? The big one is 22,000. Is that a lot in terms of the investment people have to make into restaurants and where do they Well, in terms of the payback, you're looking at between five and seven years, which is kind of comparable to maybe investing in heat pumps and solar panels and so on. I mean, it is another renewable technology in that space. It's in that innovation space. So, yeah, we think it's comparable and competitive. And because it's solving so many problems immediately and you get savings immediately, we think it's really well worth it. Yeah. And obviously people like it because, as I mentioned earlier, you are already exporting. Yes. And they came to you. They came to us. Where did they find you? They found us through the website and doing searches on the web. So somebody told us that they were looking for small AD plants and we came up or micro AD, which is anaerobic digestion on a Google search. AD, yeah. And we came up as an option. Now, you have to give a shout out to whoever is doing your promotion online because he or she is obviously doing the right thing. Oh, you were talking to her, are we? Well At done, moment, you. Now, we do have a fantastic marketing company as well called Frank and Marcy and they're helping us with our content marketing, which is really important because it's all about a journey of understanding with a new product. So they're in the background at the moment, but all the tweeting and the insting and all that kind of stuff. Now, I have to remind people that you, what you said at the very beginning is two years ago, pre-COVID, you were singing for a living. Singing nothing, for my supper, yes. Nothing with to do with digesters or anything else. No, just conversations, really. I mean, I suppose I was learning about the technology because clearly it's not my background. Um, but what's encouraging is, I suppose, what I'd say to other people who are starting businesses is that a lack of knowledge isn't a barrier, you know, once you're willing to I've learn. I've met a lot of business open. people who have made a lot of money with no knowledge whatsoever. Well, there you go. You know, once you're willing to learn, I think, and you have some creative skill and you're able to improvise and think creatively, I think that's really you know, a very good place to start. So you've given up rock and roll. Yeah. And you're going, to, you're going to just put on the pinstripe suit now. What's the plan? Yeah, the What's pinstripe the big plan? suit. The big plan is to keep scaling if we can. We want to serve as many people as we can. It's going to be an incremental journey because there's lots happening at the same time as you can imagine between, um, I suppose, all the time trying to find the right customers, trying to make sure we're serving them well. Um, and how are you doing both of those? 
Where do you find your customers? Well, I suppose we're reaching out all the time in terms of active market research now. So that's what we started to do now, whereas before this was all inbound. And what does that mean? Does it mean that you sit on a desk looking at a restaurant, 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 ring them up, ring them up, ring them up? Um, well, yeah, contacting them and kind of, you know, getting into the car, going out and meeting people, you know, starting in West Cork, for instance, where there's lots of restaurants around where you can go around and say, look, tell me about your business and tell me what the pain points are, et cetera, et cetera. And then, yes, reaching out online also. Um, so there's all of that going on. And then we have a good market team, as I said, so they do lots of interviews for us at the moment. They're doing a lot of interviews with people who are restaurant owners and they're gathering lots of data that we'd be able to use to see if we can match up and see if we can support them and find a solution that suits them. So, you know, all very encouraging at the moment. And you're raising cash. And we're raising cash. Yeah. Aid, and where are you going to get your cash? Um, well, we don't know where we're going to get it yet, um, but we're raising one million. And, and where did you come up with that number? Um, well, we did the costings. We looked at all our various uh, needs there in terms of manufacturing, in terms of hires, in terms of costs and stocks and wages and you name it, it's all in there. And uh, and we're still being, you know, we're trying to be careful and make sure that we're doing it properly down to the penny. Um, so, we're, yeah, we're looking at raising and we have somebody working with us. We have a good, um, we have an angel investor already, so she's got the, the finance background that we need. She was a seri- well, there was a bit of a gap in terms of the expertise there so we have somebody on board helping us with that and it's really really helped us to shape our message for investors so yeah we're looking at that and I was delighted to hear and I was kind of surprised to hear that you are manufacturing in me there you well we're we have a manufacturer we have we have a contract supplier in Which time, yeah 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 so then they supply us and we bring all the gear to Clannacilty and assemble and ship out from there in fact today Connell there is an egg being installed in the Algarve in Portugal so, Kieran Coffey, who's our CTO, is over there at the moment. So, in between dipping oh, in and out of the sea. There was a row over who went over there. There was a row who was going to, do, who was, yeah, exactly. But um, he's over there at the moment and they've just set up their first one and they're very, very excited. And in Portugal, actually, it's a really, we've we've set up with a green agency over there who are very interested in maybe looking at the technology further afield and, and expanding there. But outside of that, there's a very good market for this product in places like that where they have a lovely vineyards and restaurants and vineyards and farms and so on. So again, it's meeting that need of growing and meeting the need of energy and creating that kind of independence and empowerment for businesses who would like to maybe not be so dependent on fossil fuels and not dependent on suppliers for food and for fertiliser. And presumably that you can be in the middle of nowhere. You're kind of completely off grid as well. There you are. Yeah, you can be. You could be. Mm, Nice. What's the dream? What's the dream for me? Yeah. Yes, yeah, Carnegie Hall, one. I bet you. Yeah, exactly. Back in the studio making amazing pieces and reaching out with my yeah, Have you music. turned your back on music? No. That'll never happen. That'll never happen. But yeah. if you become as successful as you probably will, you won't have time to be singing. You might be singing in the car. Um, yeah, and that's good. I'm doing that already. So, um, yeah, I keep singing away in the car until I feel like I need to be out on stage again. Um, but yeah, the dream is just to try and have a good balance with really keep enjoying it and see the work developing already. We're in such an exciting space um, to have taken it as far as we have in the last year from where it was just, you know, a prototype and we were working with a very few small kind of um, supports. And now we're, we feel like we're on the edge of something that's really exciting where maybe we can provide a solution and it seems to have a lot of meaningful and sustainability power. And that's my question really about the dream. When you are putting together your pitch documents and uh, mm. the pitch decks and mm. all, mm. how many units are you planning on? Where is world domination? Where do you want to head to next? Um, Europe and the UK, I suppose, are good markets for us, we think. And we'd love to serve in Europe. Um, Is there nobody doing something similar? There are people doing something similar, but not in Europe and not in the UK. There's a company in Israel doing something similar and there's a company in Mexico, but their products are only designed for hot climate countries, so not suitable for the European market, not suitable for the Irish or the UK. And is it protected, your technology? Yeah. Good for you. So, millionaires or billionaires? Well, you know, it isn't even about the money. Of course, we want to do well. You know, we all want to be doing okay. We want to be comfortable, but we do want to be making a difference. And we want to be able to see that food waste is not going to be a problem and a challenge into the future. Climate concerns are with us all and the message is getting more urgent day by day and sustainability is where it's at. And it's funny because having been at the Cato's exhibition in the last two days, um, it seems that sustainability is really high in everyone's mind and very much a priority for every business, which is really encouraging to see. But also really, it gives you a lot of hope about the future 
when people are taking the steps that they need to take. So, yeah. I had I wasn't uh, didn't prep you for this question next. Now, have you got other big ideas as well that you that you don't have to tell me what they are? But are you, is there something else or other things bubbling away in the background in terms, in terms of, of the business? Business, um, uh, yeah, there probably are. But it's mm, yeah, I'm more kind of to do with the growing and the gardening side of things. Yeah, kind oh, of looking okay. at gardens and we might have to have you back again. Yeah, kind of more artistic garden spaces with carbon concerns and carbon kind of neutrality and all that sort of thing. But it's all on paper at the moment. Okay. So, a couple of final questions. One, you need money. You need a million quid. And uh, who would you like to give you that money? Uh, well, I kind of couldn't say right now who'd like to, who, because we're really in the very early stages. So, we can't kind of commit to something. But there's feelers being put out at the moment by our financial partner. So... But presumably you want what we call wise money. In other words, fellas who can open doors for you yeah. or fellas with, yeah. uh, fellas, or women, should I say, yeah. with fingers into yeah. the catering industries. Mm. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Yeah, possibly. You're yeah. probably made for Dragon's Den in the UK or something like that. Would you consider that? You know, God, I used to watch that program years ago. And I used to say to myself, that really looks like hell. You know, being up there it in front is, of but a, if you but go on and having, use it. Yeah, but it's funny because you see, having had to do pitches in the last hour, which I've had to do, I've been on the other side of that and I've seen what it is. So I think it's when you're well prepared, you're, con- you know, you're passionate about your product, you're interested in your area and you really want to make a difference. It actually becomes a little easier to do. Hugely easier, particularly yeah. if you do something very basic, which is actually work out how much money per unit. That's all they want to know. I know. And if you got in front of them and that uh, woman, Deborah Meaden, she's very keen on green. Okay. So uh, maybe we'll yeah. affect, as they say, we'll affect an introduction there. How about that? That would be fantastic. Fantastic, Connell. Love that. Well, we'll see what we can do there. We do actually have odd little connections, so you never know. So that's uh, the amounts of money and the people. Your heart in a heartbeat, who would that be? It would have to be Nevin Maguire. Because he's got a very, he's got a large number of restaurants. Not so much the restaurants, but Nevin actually is great for the sustainability. He's done a lot of work on, I don't know if you've ever seen his Trails Around Ireland program. I have, I have. And I think it's a, a lovely broadcaster, a lovely communicator. Local yeah. producers, different artisan producers, and you know, being out in nature. And I really think I'd love to have some conversations with Nevin. About, uh, you know, his insights into being in the food business, the kind of pay points he has. He has a fantastic place up in Black Lion and um, with outdoor gardens. He grows his own food and he's very interested in the provenance of food. So I think he'd be a great person to Don't have Don't forget to mention the new place he's just opened down in Balls Bridge. Oh yeah, in indeed. Dublin. Yeah. yeah, right there yeah. in the middle of beautiful Balls Bridge. If anybody wants to find you, MyGug, M-Y-G-U-G. Why is it called MyGug? Um, comes from uh, an old song, Googly Gug McCarkin Dov, um, that course. we used to know, that we used to know as children. And of course, a googie is another word. It's like a play word for an egg. Um, and my mother used to say it, and lots of people say it. You know, come in for your tea and have a googie. Will you have one googie? Will you have two? So that's where it comes from. Because and the product looks like a gug, an, an egg. Yeah, an and egg. it's an Irish product. So there you go, Irish what? product, Irish egg. So. Fiona, we will put, we will send people with money your way. We will also send restaurateurs your way. We might even get Nevin Maguire onto you and Deborah Meaden. How about that? Sounds like Christmas coming together. Christmas coming in February. But you're now a member of Team GBS, that great business show, and we look after each other. And the other woman, of course, to get onto your team must be Colette Toomey. Oh, for sure. Yeah. For sure. We'll have she'll to find drive you. She'll drive you. Oh, yeah, she'll sort me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Fiona Kelleher, MyGoog founder, thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. A pleasure, Connell. Thank you. Dun Deal Motors is home to Ireland's largest range of new and premium used cars. That's why you'll find cars from Audi and BMW dealerships on Dun Deal. Are you looking for a seven seater to accommodate your growing family? Maybe you're after a luxury saloon to make a statement. We have the car for you. You'll also find Ireland's largest range of electric cars to help you make the switch. 
Visit dundeal.ie today to start the search for your next car. Viscosity. When you shave, you want the highest viscosity because it helps the blade run smoother. De facto, the world's best shaving oil has incredible viscosity. That's why De facto leaves your face, underarms or legs nick-free. Higher viscosity makes blades last longer. De facto is the best for your skin and your pocket. DeFactoShave.com All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. And we are continuing our mini-series about creating value in your business and... JPA Brenton Aller, Corporate Finance Partner and Dealmaker of the Year, Jason Bradshaw, is back in studio to talk to me, valuing logistics businesses specifically. However, one of the points Jason brought to my attention was the benefit of creating a brand, no matter what your sector or even how small or niche your business. Jason Bradshaw, welcome back to That Great Business Show. Hi, Connell. You give a great introduction. <laughs> well, I should start Very by flattering. sending people back to episode 124, where you chatted to people about the nuts and bolts, the bread and butter of valuing a business and, you know, turning off the lights, the basic stuff. So go back to episode 124 if you want that, because we're building on it from there. This is like going to school, isn't it? You're meant to have done your building, homework. Building bro. Next, yeah. You're going to talk to me about logistics businesses, because that is an area of specific interest of yours. Yes. Yeah, so haulage and logistics, it's a huge... Huge. Um, I thought it's a huge sector because we're an island to start with. So we're so dependent on the sector. And I think that came to the fore probably through COVID. Um, deliveries and Brexit. And Brexit, and Brexit is, yeah, and it's still not resolved. So hopefully that might, might get better. Um, if Laren can open up, uh, to the, to the regular flow as, as, as normal. So, well, so it, be, it, we'll it, see what happens there. But that's another scale, as they say. Yes. We'll see about so what it's happens. A, it's there. a great sector. And, um, even last week there was uh, an additional support package uh, announced for the sector. An, an extra 18 million. Um, a, a business or a sector that relies on supports, is that really a business or is that a charity? It's a temporary support, as, <laughs> as, as, as they say. I know it's, it's just for the cost, the cost of diesel and... Um, so it's really just to help them because a lot of, I think, the average size of the fleet in the country is about five. So five trucks, five, trucks, five HGVs. So, uh, you know, there's a huge amount of, there's about 4,000 uh, owners in the country, business Get owners. Away. Yeah, and about, about 60% of those me. can uh, export internationally with their trucks. If you had told me 400, I might have believed you. That's huge. Yeah, about 20,000 HGVs on the road. Uh, and they are expensive vehicles. How much do they cost? They are very expensive. It's, you're starting at about 100 grand, anywhere up to 250, 300. So, huge Whoa. amount of extras. Uh, if you are place of order today, you probably wouldn't get it until uh, until next year. So, that's... A truck. A truck. So, that's the backlog uh, okay. in, in terms of orders. Every day's a school day. I love this kind of stuff. So, how do you make it valuable or more valuable? There's a lot of... How many times? How many people are running these businesses? 4,000? Is that what you said? Well, there's about 4,000 businesses, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, how do they so make 4, themselves licenses. more valuable? Again, it's it's about maximising their margin. Look at their routes. Uh, so staffing is a huge is- issue in terms of uh, the drivers, and it's a worldwide issue. The average age in Ireland of, of a HGG driver is about 48, 49, um, 1% female. Uh, really? So, yeah, and I suppose the government's been trying to get more drivers into the country. There's, I think, Kerry College have started a new driver um program, school leaver route uh, to uh, Kerry, Kerry College um, to get more drivers on the roads. But it's, it's a huge problem. Um, so it, it, it is leading to kind of shortages. I presume it, they're very well paid. I won't even go down that route because let's make this business more valuable for those 4,000 businesses. So it's really, um, I suppose, since the increase in the diesel costs, uh, a lot of the operators are charging um, an excess kind of surcharge to all their customers. Okay, so I would say the majority are charging those surcharges. There's probably some of them that aren't. So if you're not charging the surcharge, you need to be charging that. So margins have actually increased uh, through Brexit and through COVID because of these uh, surcharges. Now, it's probably only temporary. They'll probably be taken away in a, in, in a couple of years. But the surcharges have made, have made a huge difference to actually stabilising and increasing the margins in, in terms of, of the business. And the average the average margin would be, you know, 8, 10 uh, to 15%. That's all right, is it? 
yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's not it's not too bad. Um, it's very hands on. It's it it's it it's it's very obviously the working hours. So a lot of the owners would be very hands on. Um, do most or do you know whether most owners are driving or do they just have staff? In other words, that they run the business and they have four, five, six, eight, ten lorries out there. Yeah. Well, a lot of the smaller owners would actually end up driving now at the minute because there's such a shortage of, of drivers. So they're having to stand in if anyone's sick. Or I'm stuff looking like at that. your so eyes. I think you fancy you're going around with your Yorkie bar. And <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've all seen Smokey in the Bandit. So uh, <laughs> Burt Reynolds, yeah. So uh, it's, great. It's, a great, it's a great movie. So uh, it's worth watching back on Netflix, actually. But, um, but that's, you know, the drivers absolutely love it. Um, it, it it's a hard profession. Um, they're on the road a lot. I think they can drive nine hours a day with with a couple of breaks in between. So it's it, it's heavy going. Is it consolidating? Um, is there? How does somebody as a kid uh, coming back to this thing about making it more valuable and get some deals going? Is that what you really want? Yeah, there's a yes, there's a, there's a huge amount of deals in the sector. Uh, again, globalization. Uh, every sector is consolidating. So the transport and logistics sector. Is no different. So again, UK consolidators um, are kind of buying a, a lot of the larger groups. So there's kind of good multiples in the sector, probably around six, 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 maybe seven times for, for, for the high end operators. Seven times after uh, tax profits. Is that it? Uh, yeah. Adjusted profit. I know you don't like me using the word EBITDA, Connell. So uh, <laughs> adjusted profit, let's call it adjusted profit. So six to seven times adjusted profit in terms of a value uh, for for the business. Um and again, that 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 that's at the higher end of the, in terms of uh, of the trucks. So really, it's the scarcity of the trucks now is the key issue. So it's well, it's scarce capacity trucks in the means system. that the price has gone up of your of the asset sitting in your driveway or whatever it is in your truck park. Is it uh, you know the way that uh, second hand cars have gone up in price? Yeah, I wonder. You, you can't get trucks. There's at least a nine month waiting list, so you can't get a driver. So so is it a good time to sell? It's a very good time to sell. Says yeah, Jason, it's a good time to sell because, your business. because really they want your drivers as well. They want the drivers um, with, okay. the, with the new fleet that they can bring in and then merge with their own fleet so they can offer, I suppose, increased uh, capacity to their customers. Um, because, you know, if you're getting into the high end kind of operators, they have a good head office set up. So you're just basically plugging in under five or six trucks to the head office fleet um, with a very little extra overhead cost um, in terms of the head office. So it can really add to the bottom line. So, one of the things that you did tell me was that any business should, if they can, kind of get a brand name. Now, I didn't, first of all, I'm still kind of going, what? That many uh, operators? How can you actually get your name out there? You're not going to start advertising because it's not that kind of a business. How do you say Bradshaw, uh, you know, pulls better trucks or whatever? Well, you see, if you're in the sector, you will know all the operators and some operators will have good reputations, not so good reputations. And so it's just about your customer service delivery. Um, it's about the way you uh, treat your staff, the retention of your staff, because the drivers obviously speak to each other. So if you're a business owner in that sector, you want to make sure that you're retaining all your drivers and attracting new ones. So if you don't have a good reputation, uh, the business isn't going to go too far um, or continue down the road. What about the fellows in Ireland who want to buy businesses here or wherever? But I mean, you know, in other words, not to have the UK consolidators come in here. Yeah, there's still a huge, like 3,800 uh, licensed hauliers in the country. So it's a huge sector. Um, the average age, uh, you know, they're probably f ha over half would be coming to retirement age within the next 10 years in terms oh, of the owners. Okay. So it's like a lot of sectors, huge amount of consolidation needed. So that 3,800 it's probably too many for Ireland, so it needs to probably come down to probably half that. Okay. Um, because if you only have three or four trucks on the road, it's very hard to get to that um, magic number in terms of your profits. So you need to get to uh, a sustainable um, profit figure to kind of grow. And will somebody bank that? In other words, can you find funding if you want to decide that you want to consolidate and start buying all these smaller they operators? They sure will. Yeah, both of the main banks have sector specialists uh, for the transport and logistics sector. Um, so, yeah, it's and they're very much lending to the sector. So probably, 
you know, probably three and a half to four times uh, leverage is, is, is what to get in terms of valuation. So they like the sector. Um, obviously, there's, there's, there are issues coming down the tracks, decarbonisation, but that's all a few years away. Uh, EU keeps bringing out new regulations for the new trucks. So the average age of the Irish fleet's over 10 years. So oh, that's obviously old. that's old. That's old. That's very old. But you can't um, replace them because there aren't any trucks. Yeah, so you have to really have a good business plan in place for the next year, two years, five years to replace that fleet because the regs from Europe are going to keep increasing to get the emissions down. Um, so that's kind of your medium term view. Um, otherwise, you're going to get penalised f- based on your emissions. Because obviously diesel is such a huge part of your cost base. And it's not a business that will or can go away because we need to ship goods and ser- well, goods in this case, which means... Exactly. We don't have a good rail network. We should, we don't. So that we were so heavily reliant um, on the HGVs around the country. So that's why we need a good road network, which we have now in in most parts. Um, So if somebody wants to start consolidating, the name is Bradshaw, Jason Bradshaw. You'll do the business for them. That's it. Create value. And uh, you'll give them six times their adjusted earnings. If they're a good business. If they're they're a good good business. business. But it's all about planning. You need to be planning the sale of your business now for even the next two or three years or five years time. So you need to put in in place those corporate restructurings, that succession planning, all those good things in terms of when you actually want to sell your business, you're in a position to be able to sell it and get the best price possible. All the things you spoke of on number one, two, four. Worth going back and listening to Jason on that one. Jason Bradshaw, Partner at GPA Brenton Lawler. Thank you so much for joining us on that great business show. Thanks, Connell. Want to increase sales, reduce overheads, and provide customers with a better service? Then use Big Red Web, the easiest way to develop and maintain your website. It gives you powerful business reporting, digital marketing, and automatically integrates with the award winning Big Red Cloud Accounting software. It's a game changer for SME businesses. It's so good, the government gives you a €2,500 grant towards it. Big Red Web, e commerce made simple. BigRedCloud.com forward slash web. De facto shaving oil, made only from natural oils. Nothing nasty on your skin. All that great business show advertisers are Team GBS approved. Back them. And that is it from That Great Business Show, episode 128. 45 minutes of business insights and inspiration. Thanks to our sponsor, Dundeal.ie, the place to find your next car, new or second hand. Make sure to sign up for our updates on the website, thatgreatbusinessshow.com. Then you will be first to know what's coming up next. And like today's guests, do keep in touch with us on our LinkedIn page. Use it too if you would like to advertise with us. We record at the Dublin South Podcast Studios where Lee, becoming a brand name Brennan, is today's sound engineer. Later, Neil Horner will add his own digital insights to our podcast in post-production. And don't forget to buy Business Plus magazine where we now have that regular column all about the podcast. So for me, Conal O'Mora and Mila Buechas for listening. Agus Slán Tamil. 